performance to the next level. I hope you enjoy. Mike, how are you doing today? Doing awesome, sir. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm uh, I'm really excited to kind of dig into this whole idea around microbiome and gut bacteria. But before we jump in there, can you give us a little bit of your background and how you got into the uh, the health and fitness and wellness uh, field? Sure, Dr. Mark, I'd be happy to. So, yeah, you know, as as long as I can remember, I've been interested in uh, just aesthetics and, and bodybuilding and, you know, was a huge fan back when I was a child, like was like six years old, I think, like uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, all those karate movies and, and just, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So started lifting weights. My older brothers got me into lifting weights, you know, when I was an early teenager and then read, you know, the encyclopedia of bodybuilding and, and followed folks like Lee Haney back in the day and so forth. And then, uh, um, you know, just got a degree in biology, you know, did the NASM certification in personal training and so forth and realized that, um, you know, I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper in, into some of the metabolic aspects of our, our physiology and so forth. And so pursued a master's degree in nutrition and had our aspirations of, of going to medical school and started working with an internal medicine doctor in, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, you know, seeing a lot of his kind of metabolic syndrome, overweight, you know, type uh, clients and so forth. And, you know, realized that, you know, some of these overweight people, you know, that um, whether it was personal training that I was doing with them or uh, nutrition coaching, they were actually eating less food than I was, you know, and I was um, much leaner and had a lot more muscle. And I was like, totally confused, like, how can this be possible? So I realized that this whole calorie in calorie out thing was bogus. And this is going back to like 2006. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, so, I, you know, it kind of started to kind of question some of the paradigms that we've been, you know, um, that have been put in our heads for a while. And then one of the medical assistants in the in the clinic who was morbidly obese underwent bariatric surgery. And uh, she ate like crap, you know, Cokes and sodas and, and Twinkies and just all the junk food, right? So it was like, in my mind, like no surprise that she was overweight. But that being said, she underwent this gastric bypass procedure and within two weeks was off her metformin, her blood sugar medication, I had lost a lot of weight very quickly and then was like an entirely new person within a month. So, you know, I, I love you know, having the degree in biology and knowing how to do research. I was really kind of interested in to dive deeper into, you know, how does gastric bypass surgery work? Because to me, it was so quick. Even if someone was just like kind of starving themselves or it was re reducing how much food was absorbed, I thought there had to be more to the story. And so I went to uh, uh, University of uh, the Medical School Library in, in Denver there and then uh, started researching it. it turns out that gastric bypass surgery changes the microbiome it changes gut hormones and so that you know a lot of interesting that's incredible yeah so that, that and then I decided gosh you know a lot of doctors don't know this they're not aware and actually you know I do a lot of you know public lecturing to healthcare practitioners and fitness professionals and so forth and one of the first questions that I ask them is how does gastric bypass surgery work and you know nine out of ten people in the room will raise their hand and say Oh, well, that's an obvious it restricts how much food people eat and it's actually that's a small mechanism So, you know this, this whole microbiome and, and the the gut hormone story the so-called incretins Which we can talk about kind of a category of endocrine hormones that are released from the stomach play a huge role in our Digestive and metabolic physiology and the good news is we don't have to undergo this very invasive and irreversible procedure known as gastric bypass We can manipulate these gut hormones naturally through diet lifestyle, you know time uh, based eating and, and various supplements and so forth so that that kind of started the the work of uh, the book that, that you mentioned in the, in the introduction the belly fat effect and so on Well, that's always good when we know that there's first places to go instead of going straight under the knife So that's uh, that's very exactly. encouraging um, Can you kind of set the tone here for us and then describe what the microbiome is and then maybe you know talk about some of these um, hormones like the incretins and how they're influenced by um, By the surgery or even our the microbiome yeah, wonderful point. So, you know, I think a lot of your listeners are probably have heard of the topic of the microbiome and that just kind of encapsulates this microbial ecosystem that uh, resides on us and within us. And, you know, it, it outnumbers, you know, our cells, uh, you know, estimates used to say 10 to 1. Now we're saying like 5 to 1. But it, it, it's, it's a, a huge ecosystem. And, you know, the thing is, a lot of doctors were not taught about this in medical school, you know, and so I'd do a lot of like, like online interviews and Dr. Bubs, we just had you on the show, which was really awesome. Um, but I, so I interviewed, you know, people and one uh, NIH funded researcher, he said, you know, the microbiome is so vast and, and so important. It's like, you know, medical school students, it, it's imagine them going through, whether it's naturopathic school, chiropractic school, traditional allopathic medical school, imagine studying the entire body 
and not learning about the liver. You know, I mean, the liver releases glycogen, and it, it, and uh, you know, it involves it's involved in detoxification. Fundamental it's, for everything, yeah. Fundamental. I hear so you're going. It's, does so much right and so it turns out that the microbiome is actually uh, a, a larger contributes more metabolic functions and dna and and physiology uh compared to our liver so it's it's that active it's very very important but how does it relate to obesity specifically is really the kind of the question that, that people are kind of interested in well it turns out that when you eat a processed you know, a diet rich in processed food, you actually foster the growth of unhealthy uh, bacteria that actually are very efficient at harvesting energy from the food that you eat. So if you look at the stool of an overweight person versus a lean individual and give them an isocaloric, like a calorie matched meal, you'll see that the stool of the overweight person has actually less energy in it. So as humans, we're not 100% efficient, like our cars, you know, where you drive them and then the gas tank is empty. There's always a little bit of energy or calorie material in our feces. And it turns out that, you know, the type of bacteria that you have can kind of govern how much caloric material, whether it's carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and so forth, are harvested from the stool. So it turns out that, that overweight people generally have bacteria that are very efficient at getting every last calorie and, and macronutrient from the food that they eat. So that's a major point. And, and we'll talk about how we can reverse that, but I'll just kind of throw a plug out there right now. It's dietary diversity is the key thing. So a broad array of phytonutrients, herbs, botanicals, different types of fibers. It's not just like Wheaties and whole grains. We're talking about radicchio and endive and arugula and broccoli and as, as many different types of and the broad array of vegetables that one can eat will actually increase the diversity and selective growth of different bacteria. So what we're really striving for here is kind of like the take home when it comes to the microbiome is a really diverse ecosystem. And that diversity in the ecosystem really garners a lot of stability uh, on the genomic level, on the enzymatic metabolite level, and overall kind of uh, the ecolog ecological system level. And so that's what's really important. And when we have this lack of diversity from just really limited food choices, you know, the standard you know, Western diet and so forth, processed foods, what we have is a relative imbalance in what we know to be called a gram-negative endotoxin harboring bacteria. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that if you were to pull blood from overweight individuals or even from healthy athletes, after they were to eat a meal rich in, you know, McDonald's or junk food, what you're going to find is high levels of this gram-negative a bacterial component called endotoxin and that's inversely linked with health right we know high levels of endotoxin are linked with diabetes with alzheimer's disease with memory loss with cancer with autoimmunity i mean it's this little bacterial component is actually what will you know if you were to pour freight your bowel from maybe a, a severe accident or a, a, a knife wound endotoxin would kill you actually that's what's known as like sepsis in the hospital so yep. this is a very you know validated medical phenomenon so there's enough bacterial constituents in our gi tract that they would literally kill us and that's why the gut barrier is so important so when you have leaky gut induced through diet through stress through alcohol through medications and these these uh, components these endotoxin components come in they wreak havoc within our immune system. They drive leptin resistance. They affect insulin signaling. They do a lot of nasty things. And so that's, this is one of the, another main mechanism in addition to the calorie uh, harvesting and energy harvesting that overweight people generally have within their bacteria is a high level of these endotoxin producing bacteria, which again is a, a really a function of a few things, but it's that lack of bacterial diversity. So the ecosystem is imbalanced, and so then we, we get things like a predator of sorts, and this predator bacteria, to use the analogy of like maybe a wolf or something, uh, is is in disproportion uh, level to the entire ecosystem. So it, it gets across and it causes a major issue. And so what's really unique is the same foods that induce bacterial diversity and keep the ecosystem robust actually downregulate endotoxin absorption as well. So those are things like nuts and seeds and, you know, a real ancestral based diet actually prevents that. So it's really important, again, to kind of get back to the roots and all the things that you talk about in your book, The Paleo Project, because those are the type of foods that will prevent that. That's awesome, Mike. I mean, there's a lot of um, points there I kind of want to circle back to. Now, if we if we even just back up a second, just say, that, you know, the average GP or, or, or personal trainer, somebody comes in, um, you know, if their client has a significant amount of belly fat, can we mm -hmm. pretty much assume that there's going to be this this dysbiotic um, bacteria or this lack of, of bacterial diversity within their microbiome? Yeah, that's an awesome question, you know, and 
I think the answer is yes. And I talk about this in the book a lot. So there's a lot of studies that have come out. I mean, these started coming out, Dr. Bubs, in like 2011, would show it, independent of all other health parameters. So like C-reactive protein and, you know, fibrinogen and ferritin and other like acute phase reactants, independent of all those inflammatory parameters and so forth. Belly fat is linked with imbalanced gut bacteria and even intestinal permeability. So there was one study published in Nature Reviews Obesity. So the Nature Publishing Group publishes, in my opinion, some of the most reputable science and, and they're very uh, stringent about what you know uh, quality methods and so forth that the scientific uh, uh, authors are, are submitting so I really like that publishing group but yeah long story short they've published quite a few studies uh, these are you know researchers at think Johns Hopkins some folks in Italy and France and so forth that have independently correlated uh, imbalanced gut bacteria and or intestinal permeability uh, with both uh, belly fat, you know, obesity and central obesity, but also specifically, which I think is really cool, uh, triglycerides, elevated blood levels of triglycerides, elevated levels of hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose and fasting insulin. So that's the other component too, is, is you know, a lot of people are coming in with lab work uh, and uh, so they can, you know, you can see if, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So there this whole go. blood sugar dysregulation, right, is really kind of a, it starts in the gut. And so again, there's enough data there that we can be very confident in, you know, not having to do a lot of esoteric laboratory tests and, you know, looking at like the GI map test and trying to figure out which bacteria are elevated or not. We can really just look at these traditional and readily accessible metabolic and, uh, you know, anthropomorphic uh, parameters and, and kind of see what, what's going on in the intestine that way. Yeah, I mean, that's great because we can really, on this topic, you can really get very, you can really go down the rabbit hole, can't you, in terms of all the specifics and all the pathways and the different um, um, signaling pathways that are involved. And then at the end of the day, when we, you know, we'll kind of circle back to, um, to to dietary interventions and changes that people can make. It can actually be quite simple in terms of helping to reverse things. But but talk to us a little bit about this idea of the impact of the microbiome on, on blood sugar response to meals or on insulin function. Um, you know, what impact does that play if, if we've got a more dysbiotic, somebody who's overweight, belly fat, a more dysbiotic uh, microbiome? Yeah, wonderful point. Well, first of all, it comes again from that endotoxin. So that endotoxin kind of, and this is a new way of looking at the origin of insulin resistance and leptin resistance. We generally think that that the macronutrient imbalances within the the diet and then the absorption therein within the serum are shifting that. Like when we have a high glycemic meal, it's gonna release a lot of insulin and then the receptors are gonna say, hey, no, insulin, what are you doing? And they're gonna become down regulated and desensitized. But what we what we know actually happens uh, first, well, there's two, two things we'll talk about, kind of the endotoxin and then the gut hormones. But what it turns out is when you have this endotoxin material, it triggers inflammatory pathways. And so we know these things called cytokines, these little mediators that the immune system uses to communicate signals, things like TNF alpha and interleukin six and interferon gamma and all these, you know, there's a, a whole myriad of these different cytokines. They actually are kind of the genesis and kind of the upstream of inducing insulin resistance. And so we know that insulin resistance at, at some level is really fundamentally inflammatory based. And so this is why when people sit all day, they become, you know, there's a low grade of inflammation and that affects the insulin receptor signaling. We know that if you know, we talked about sepsis in the hospital, if you have trauma or something, um, you know, it's very, actually the, the cytokine that's very uh, widely recognized called TNF alpha, you can measure it in your bloodstream. It used to be called cachectin because it was, it would induce cachexia and muscle wasting. This was its first name back in the 1940s. And and it also induced insulin resistance. And so that's kind of interesting. So we need to really, I would love for practitioners and, and coaches listen to this, think about uh, in, in, inflammation is upstream of insulin resistance. And so if someone is having blood sugar dysregulation, they're on blood sugar lowering medications and so forth, we really need to look at the inflammatory components in their diet, in their lifestyle, uh, you know, the foods that they're eating and also the integrity of, of their microbiome. Because if the, these bacterial particulates are coming across, they're going to affect uh, this whole insulin pathway and also leptin pathway as well. So the food cravings will be there. The blood also, sugar gonna, I'll jump in there because I want to yeah. sort of tie this up a little bit for people and then because leptin is going to be a big part of that, which is great that you're jumping in there. Um, but so this idea that if we do have a client who's in front of us, you know, high belly fat, you know, we can effectively say that there's going to be dysbiosis and there's going to be this level of systemic inflammation, which as you mentioned, is, a, is this driving factor behind the insulin dysfunction. Is that, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of, I mean, you can induce insulin resistance by injecting TNF alpha or endotoxin into the bloodstream. So yeah, awesome. Awesome point there. 
terrific. So now you're going to add another layer on, which is this idea of, of cravings and how bacteria can even influence cravings. So yeah, talk to us about that. Yeah, well, this is another interesting component of the whole, you know, digestive physiology and, and, and so forth. So when just the thought of eating food or the smell of food and cooking food and chewing food releases a, uh, a lot of these different hormones from the GI tract itself. So, th you know, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, the gut is the first contact point that food has within the body. So it would make sense that it would send these messages to communicate to the rest of the body to say, hey, guys, we have food coming in. Just, you know, be war be ready and so forth. And so it turns out that, you know, this category of endocrine hormones called the incretin hormones uh, there's 26 different hormones they range they have a lot of funky little names like glp1 and cck and pyy and glp2 and there's a lot of these different hormones but they actually in turn affect you know that they, they'll tell the pancreas to release insulin and then they'll tell the muscle cells to uh, be sensitive to insulin's message they'll tell the brain you know to that we need to eat more we need to eat less you know they actually there's receptors in the heart for glp1 and pyy and these other hormones that uh, affect affect heart contractility and, and the inflammatory response. I mean, they do a lot of different things. And it's no surprise that the drug companies now, their whole you know new pipeline of medications are going after this whole incretin axis. So gotcha. you'll, you'll see medications like GLP-1 agonists and DPP-4, which is an enzyme. They're called DPP-4 inhibitors, and they actually inhibit the breakdown of the gut hormones. And guess what? That bariatric surgery that we talked about is a major, me, uh, major driver by, uh, through which these gut hormones are increased. And people always ask like, why or how? Well, it turns out that when you kind of restructure the intestines and you're sending food right from the esophagus to the duodenum, so you take the stomach out of the picture, it's like, you know, taking a microphone to your ear. And if someone says, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. The message is so overpowering for that desensitized stomach that's been you know, kind of resistant to the messages because the food was unhealthy and didn't have the phytonutrients and so forth and the bacteria was off. So the message is amplified. It's so strong that the small intestine is now releasing super physiologic levels of these gut hormones, these incretin hormones. Wow. So then we get, yeah, we get the blood sugar reduction. Actually, incidentally, this is what really got me excited, Dr. Mark, is a paper, uh, I think it was Nature Reviews, Endocrinology and Metabolism, if I'm not mistaken, but talked about how insulin dependent so these are full-blown type 2 diabetics. You know, they've been pushing the needle at both ends, eating junk food, and their blood sugar is so dysregulated, they need exogenous insulin to maintain a homeostasis in their metabolic physiology. Uh, they no longer need insulin after undergoing bariatric surgery within 12 hours. So this is how Incredible. quick. Wow. Keep in mind, they're getting TPN, right? You know, they're not really eating food uh, like a traditional diet 12 hours after the, the surgery. So so this is very powerful stuff. But interestingly, in that same article that, that you know, really talked about how great bariatric surgery is for reducing uh, the, you know, restoring normal um, insulin physiology. They also said, well, there's a lot of natural ways that we can mimic this hormonal effect without having to undergo the procedure. So that's the thing I'd like to let people know about. So some of the things, you know, we can kind of talk about just eating breakfast actually increases your gut hormone. So I know there's a lot of different ideas out there with intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding and so forth. But I think you and I agree with this. Breakfast is one of these kind of keystone meals and it kind of sets the tone for the day. And there's a lot of evidence to support kind of the mechanisms through which breakfast functions. And it turns out that breakfast eaters compared to non-breakfast eaters have higher levels of these gut hormones. So the GLP-1s, the CCKs, all these hormones that, again, the dr drug companies are trying to go after and, and uh, artificially increase through pharmaceutical compounds. So Definitely. Uh, exercise. I mean, you know, yeah. breakfast is definitely one of those key ones. And I think making the right choices for a lot of people is obviously the, the tricky part because the average, you know, Western or North American, uh, even European breakfast can be very high carbohydrate, high, high sugar, etc. Now, I know, you know, some of the easy wins might be and, and, you know, you can confirm this for us, you know, just simply reducing sugar intake um, of meals or breakfast meals overall, um, reducing carbohydrate intake tends to have a good, uh, at least in the initial period, uh, impact on shifting, you know, gut uh, bacteria and improving that dysbiotic bacteria. Are those, you know, some simple strategies that you know trainers or GPs could think about uh, first. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know, it turns out that the, these good fats, you know, so this is one of the mechanisms through which this kind of low carb, this ketogenic style diet, and and even a paleo diet works is, you know, these uh, receptors that that affect the gut hormones and and then in turn affect our appetite and blood sugar regulation. They love you know fats and different types of protein, different types of fiber. So it's really like you know we're understanding kind of 
the mechanisms through which an ancestral style diet works. And it, it turns out it's through affecting, like we talked about the gut hormones and also the gut bacteria. So yeah, those simple carbohydrates, they really don't, uh, white breads and sugars and croissants and whatever else, they don't uh, tend to you know amplify these gut hormones. They tend to just kind of go along through and the, and the receptors don't really recognize them. They're absorbed. Uh, you know, it's kind of sugar and so forth and uh, fermented it by the, the microbiome and don't really increase short chain fatty acids in these healthy things. So it turns out that you need a little bit more complexity and uh, to your diet. And, and again, a simple thing is just cook your food from scratch, right? Avocado, eggs, uh, uh, nut seeds. And we, you know, you talk about them a lot in your book and recipes and so forth. So it turns out that diet sends the right messages to the gut. And that can be pretty quick too. I mean, people are used to sort of eating, you know, eggs is definitely one. I mean, you know, the medical system, we've scared people off consuming eggs, but definitely that's a nice breakfast option. Um, and I guess when you look at even, again, the Western diet, I mean, it's such high carbohydrate choices first thing in the morning, breakfast cereals, granolas, orange juice, that you sort of, it's not a big surprise that we're in this problem in the first place when you when you just talked about all the, the influences on insulin signaling and leptin and these endotoxemia and, and predator bacteria just by having this higher carbohydrate, higher processed food diet. And it's basically three quarters of the population are, you know, that's how they start their day. So that's definitely an area where, yeah, getting that lower carb breakfast sounds like a pretty nice solution. Now, you were just about to jump into some exercise there before I before I cut you off there. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about how exercise would impact this microbiome for that, again, that average client trying to shift some belly fat? Sure, I would love to. And I'll just, you know, do a little sidestep to cap off that discussion is also researchers at Duke University have talked about, they've looked at different types of protein. So we know a lot of people like smoothies for breakfast. And I agree with you, you know, Dr. Mark, I think, you know, the eggs and the avocado and, and real food is a, you know, staple. But for people that are traveling, they're on the road, they have a limited time in the morning. Um, just be aware of this research at Duke University, they've actually shown that pea protein and whey protein compared to other proteins. So they looked at soy, they looked at fish, they looked at meat protein from animals. And what they found is that whey protein and pea protein, this is good news, guys, it actually increases these gut hormones and affects the incretin axis. So if you are short on time or you're getting sick of eggs and bacon and avocado or whatever, you know, you can throw in a protein shake here and there, but just, you know, make sure to add in a little bit of the veggies and the fiber and so forth, because that will uh, help with the betero diversity and so on. But and that's um, a great comment because a lot of people forget to add the protein to that breakfast smoothie. You know, it ends up being a lot of other things, but they sort of forget that protein and fat. So that's 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 fantastic to know that it's going to help set things up on the microbiome side of things as well. Yeah, it's huge. You know, I mean, there's a lot of natural juiceries in Toronto and other major cities. And I, I go, you know, a lot of people think they're doing themselves a favor by having juice. It's alkaline, there's phytonutrients. But I, I look at these juices and oftentimes the first ingredient, and folks should look out for this, is the Granny Smith apple, which is the sweetest and the, the most high sugar apple. So if you're going to have just like a vegan style diet, try and throw in the pea protein because that is, you know, vegan, vegetarian friendly, but it does have, you know, those amino acids that affect this, this gut hormone level and so Perfect. on. Perfect. Great suggestion. Just yeah. Sure. So exercise. Yeah, it's really unique. I mean, a lot of folks know this anecdotally after they exercise they're not as hungry you know they, they um, we do know that it's good to get amino acids and BCAs and so forth uh, to stimulate muscle protein synthesis but one of the mechanisms that kind of may affect our blood sugar transiently after exercise in a good way that you know rebalance that and also affect our appetite and reduce the inflammatory response researchers have shown the mechanism there is actually increasing these gut hormones so it turns out that it's the more intense in a short duration like interval style training the higher levels of these gut hormones Hormones. So they've looked at, there's a few studies, I haven't looked at this in the last six months or so, but uh, a lot of it is in the book, Belly Fat Effect. And so mostly this short duration, high intensity interval style training dramatically increases these gut hormones. And, and so that's one of the, again, another, yet another mechanism that we understand. We know that exercise, and I'm sure you've talked about it on the show, increases mitochondrial biogenesis and fat burning and all that. But, you know, the gut hormones are another, another key point. So a, a great way, again, to talking about like easy you know, kind of targets, if you will, or, or lifestyle modalities that people can do right now. And we talked about this before, you know, when I interviewed you, Dr. Mark is getting out and getting some activity first thing in the morning. And that can be intense yoga, you know, cause that's kind of a burst of sorts that can be walking on a treadmill, doing some sprints, uh, you know, biking to work, walking to work, just doing something to get moving, I think is really important. So, you know, when you set the stage for the day of getting these gut hormones high, there tends to be kind of like a uh, the effects have a, they last throughout the day, which is really important. So you tend to make better food choices as the day goes on because your blood sugar regulation is in a tighter window. So we know that, you know, that 
the delta, the change between you know your baseline level and then the post meal level, we want that to be as minimal as possible. So when the delta is really high, you go from say 85 you know to 160, then you get all these counter regulatory hormones, the cortisol, the adrenaline, and then that affects you know your whole day, your whole mental outlook, you know food preference throughout the day. So by doing these small things, eating breakfast, getting movement, you're changing the gut hormones so that you know the peak and the trough, if you will, of your blood sugar is not so um, Extreme, exaggerated. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. a great one because I mean, especially when we talk about uh, interval based training, I mean it's so effective for. Um, fat burning, uh, EPOC, VO2 max, even heart health, but we tend to almost forget about the, you know, like you mentioned, this amazing impact on on, on gut hormones and, and how that plays out in terms of, um, you know, cravings throughout the day and the trickle down effect on 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 gut and immunity and everything else. So it's it's great. Uh, I think the that that client that that one trying to lose twenty or thirty pounds that has all the, you know, some belly fat to shift they are often the ones that are on the treadmill doing the 30, 45, 60 minutes at a steady pace and, and struggling mm-hmm. to make that progress. So I think that's, uh, you know, for the GPs, again, trainers out there, you know, making sure we're shifting them over to that has just got so many foundational benefits. It's it's terrific. Yeah. Now, if we shift more. over a little bit to now to more of the, you know, elite athlete, if you will, or even just, you know, your, your really avid exerciser, you know, I know you come from an endurance uh, exercise background, so I think that's where, you know, typically consumption of, you know, simple sugars, I mean, on a performance side of things, that's that's typically, you know, recommendation number one to reach the top of the podium. So how does that mm-hmm. impact the microbiome of our endurance athletes, both recreational and, uh, you know, more elite? Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of talked about it a little bit, you know, but it, it's, it just doesn't have the diversity or the array of different complex, you know, fibers and phytonutrients. So that's kind of the main mechanism. But you know, I think, you know, if you're an endurance athlete or you're, you're working with them, what you notice is the, the, the high carbohydrate eaters generally tend to have, uh, you know, not as much muscle mass and uh, a little bit more body fat. And so I, what I found in kind of the weekend warrior types, and we talked about this, you know, um, so I was living in Boulder, Colorado. This is this at the time, and I think it still is kind of the endurance uh, mecca of the world. A lot of Australians and Europeans and so forth would train there, you know, because you're training at high altitude and For so sure, forth. yeah. And um, what, and this was in 2006, right when I first get, started getting into this paleo diet thing. And, and Lauren Cordain, actually, he's from you know, Fort Collins, so just a you know 100 miles away or whatever. So, um, you know, I got into this research, and so that's when I started the paleo uh, diet, you know, kind of thing. And, and so my carbohydrate base was more like yams and butternut squash, and more of kind of a higher fat, high protein, lower carb style diet. And um, I really, I mean, you can perform at a very high level eating that way and you actually stay very lean, which is advantageous for anyone doing kind of an endurance sport, you know, because the power to weight ratio is a big thing, whether it's swimming or biking or running, whatever. Um, And so what we find is that when carbohydrate, you know, really carb adapted athletes, you know, they generally tend to have a higher level of body fat, which is not good. So I think the thing that people just need to be honest with themselves and realize that, yeah, when you're doing high intensity type work, you know, use the carbohydrate like you would use caffeine or some sort of other substance before and after. But really, I mean, if you're getting most of your, your caloric material from good protein, good fats, and a small amount of more complex fiber rich carbohydrates, you're going to be okay. And so that's what, you know, I, it takes some experimentation. You have to have time and so forth to adapt but i think that's kind of the the best thing for a lot of people yeah i think you nailed it right there because i you know here the clinic um you know i'm downtown toronto and we get a lot of guys who maybe used to be runners but now they've dovetailed into cycling and they're they're logging a lot of kilometers in a week um and their performance is up but some of these guys are holding on to 10 20 30 pounds of of, of belly fat and extra weight and that's when you start to think to yourself you mentioned that you know power to weight ratio and and just rethinking how we're going to fuel during some of these rides because that over reliance on simple carbs if you're tr- if you're still 20 pounds overweight is is not going to be your best strategy you know just finding that middle ground like you mentioned is is really key now how about in terms of you know team sport athletes or you know is there implications there i know um you know things like plane travel is a big one for professional athletes whether it's the nba or major league baseball um you know, things like circadian rhythms plane travel does that impact the microbiome 
Yeah, that's well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of research there. So there's this crosstalk and correlation there. So um, we we need to make sure that we're blocking that artificial light and trying to, you know, get up and rise at the same time daily. That's another big thing. And and this time of year when it's you know days are really short, getting some beeswax you know style candles, putting them around the house so that you're not having uh, artificial light and stuff. I think is a huge thing. But there's a lot of crosstalk uh, between the microbiome and circadian rhythms, and one influences the other. So that's the you know, I have a friend of mine from the UK that is a high-level uh, jujitsu and karate, a black double black belt in both, and and so wow. he actually uses um, food to entrain his body's circadian rhythm. So, for example, if he's going from the UK to San Francisco, right, he's going that a few days before he's going to start eating his foods that would be commensurate with the time in San Francisco, and that will actually induce his circadian rhythm. So whether it's the microbiome, the gut hormones, or whatever, but there is this crosstalk. And so it's really, and I travel you know, coast to coast quite frequently from Seattle to Toronto, Vancouver to Toronto, New York, wherever, and I, I've implemented, uh, implemented his, Alessandro's uh, uh, philosophy there, and it's really helped me with uh, adapting to different time zones. So I think athletes could do that um, as well. And again, it, you, you got to minimize the inputs, the light and so forth. Getting first morning light is one of the best ways to re entrain your body's circadian rhythm, but obviously the food plays a huge role. So just, you know, if you're going to be playing uh, or participating in some event, just start to eat on that time zone as, the, as whatever, let's say you eat breakfast at 8 a.m. and then lunch or a snack at one and then dinner early at six or whatever, just skew that a little bit so that you're eating within that time zone. And, and surprisingly, um, when you travel, you'll notice that you feel less fatigued, you're more energetic, and you've kind of realigned your body's rhythm. So I think that's another huge uh, kind of little rock, if you will, that you can move out of the way and accelerate your performance. Yeah, that's a great recommendation, even for you know the busy executives or whomever is doing the plane travel, hopping um, from one city to the next uh, is, is another yeah fantastic strategy to just get into that time zone a little bit quicker so you can stay sharp mentally as well if you're you know having to work and, and perform on that side of things. Right. Uh, Terrific. Now, also around the gut health, I mean, we see this a lot in football and ice hockey, the, you know, the reliance on painkillers and NSAIDs in particular. Um, yeah. you, you touched on the microbiome and, you know, how a dysbiotic bacteria can influence things like leaky gut. Can you, can you bring the NSAIDs into the picture? Are they helping or hurting or, or what's the impact there? Yeah, yeah, that's an awesome point. You know, uh, they are definitely hurting. So that's that's a challenge. A lot of these, whether it's endomethacin or you know ibuprofen and all these compounds, they really perturb the lining and, and weaken the integrity of the gut, which is not a good thing. And so, uh, when that happens, you know, we're we're actually well, this is kind of a sidestep, but this is early research actually shows that the gut has a lot of mitochondria and participates in whole body fat burning, and it's really active. And we think about you know processing all this nutrients and squeezing and the parasaltus and all that. There's a lot of activity going on and and these NSAIDs and other compounds like PPIs and so forth actually may be at the cellular level destroying the the, the mitochondria within the gut that powers the motility and so forth so that's not good obviously for a you know malabsorption and, and indigestion and also slow release of these gut hormones so you know we need to look at more and here's the as just a sidestep it'll circle right back you know as, as we get more fat adapted actually our baseline levels of inflammation go down our body's more efficient there's not as much oxidative stress and so mediators that drive the inflammatory process and actually a, gr a good proxy for inflammation is heart rate variability. What a lot of people will notice if they start testing their baseline heart rate variability, there's a great app called HRV for training. Uh, there's the Heart Math Institute. They have a wonderful biofeedback device. But, you know, suffice it to say, I mean, when, when you start restricting the carbs, getting more fat adapted, your HRV, your heart rate variability improves, which is positive. That shows that you're really in that more digest and rest and parasympathetic branch of your, your autonomic, autonomic nervous system. So that's a really good thing. So, um, the bottom line is that you know these these drugs these compounds they do affect the gut at a, at a negative level but you may not need to take these compounds if you are a more of a fat adapted type athlete because your baseline level of inflammation is going to be reduced or attenuated, right? So you're not going to have as many aches and pains. Like we, we can't avoid the trauma associated with sport, but if your baseline level is lower, the recovery is going to be faster. And so that's one of the things that, you know, I've personally noticed is recovery, you know, that delayed onset muscle soreness, the DOMS associated with weight training and so forth, that isn't as bad for me anymore, even though I really push it in the gym and fail at six to eight reps 
and wow. you know superset and all that you you don't get that oh my gosh i can barely move my my legs kind of thing after a hard leg day so it's really interesting you're still causing that adaptation you're still causing those muscle to you know the the adaptation involved in hypertrophy and all that but you know because your level of inflammation is lower your heart rate variability is improved you're more your your kind of steady state in that uh, parasympathetic branch of your nervous system things are better so so again this is one of the ad- advantages of kind of eating this way getting these gut hormones high uh, and uh, getting out some of these these simple carbs because they're really inflammatory you know on a, on a cellular level and uh, they can um, you know, again, so then you become reliant upon these medicines that have a huge impact, you know, so we talked about endotoxin that gets absorbed. And so an easy way to cause metabolic endotoxemia is to take ibuprofen before you eat a meal, you know, cause you're damaging the small intestine and that's going to let these bacterial particulate in. So yeah, definitely, obviously if you, if you need them, you rolled your ankle or whatever, um, short, uh, short term's okay for a couple days short, if you need them. Exactly. And pair them with zinc carnosine. So this is a nutrient that's been studied in Japan for uh, H. pylori and ulcers and so forth. It's a a form of zinc that seems to have a reparative effect and can kind of ameliorate some of the downside associated with uh, endomethacin and ibuprofen and all these other uh, NSAIDs. Because we even see some weekend warriors who you know things are getting bad when they start popping the Advils before ibuprofens before the training session. I mean, that's uh, we know that training itself is going to induce some damage to the gut. Uh, some stress to the gut as well. So that's obviously a big no-no, right? Big no-no. And you want that ad- adaptation. So that's that's the other thing. I mean, I, have, I can't remember specific studies, but I have uh, read some headlines on uh, Science Daily and things like that where, you know, if people take antioxidants after exercise, guess what? Well, you actually reduce the efficacy of the exercise. So yep. you want that signaling. And so I think you know, training with trying to reduce the signaling is, is not going to be adaptive for your training. And uh, so, yeah, you definitely I, I think that's a terrible idea on multiple levels. For sure, for sure. That's definitely you're going down the wrong path if that's uh, if you yeah. notice yourself doing that. Um, last one here would be great before we have to wrap things up. Um, what about sleep? The impacts, you know, people now are not getting enough sleep. I think we're averaging less than six and a half hours, and about a third of the population are less than six per night. So, what is that doing to the microbiome? Yeah, that's, this is huge, you know, so it, it turns out like pretty much like we talked about every single thing, you know, that we do, whether it's exercise, stress too much, you know, not eat the right foods, it affects the microbiome and, and obviously our physiology, but sleep is a big one. Uh, but it does affect all these hormones that we talked about, you know, in even leptin too. So you're going to have more cravings, you're going to have blood sugar dysregulation. So sleep is a major uh, you know, kind of puzzle piece in this whole equation, but it's not just getting the eight hours. It's also how are you breathing while you're sleeping? And people might think that's a little bizarre. Uh, but I've been, uh, you know, really kind of helping people to better understand this nose breathing versus mouth breathing. And while you're getting your deep REM sleep, if you're breathing through your mouth, what your tongue is actually doing is temporarily becoming paralyzed and, and the muscle relaxes on your airway. So you're, you're having these short episodes of hypoxic type events, which can, even though you're in deep sleep, hype, theoretically, uh, when, but if you're unable to breathe, that's, that's not, you're going to be, it's going to be interrupted sleep. So for sure, for one, sure. one little tip is get people to tape their mouth shut before they go to bed. So you get, you know, at shoppers or Walgreens or Rite Aid. <laughs> that's fantastic. It, it, yeah, I like that. Market, it works amazingly. I can't tell you. I mean, this is one of the things that I, um, have been just, it's, there's a lot of things that have changed my life from a diet, you know, functional medicine perspective in the last 10 years. This is the number one thing that I would not give up. And so, and I'm uh, thinking a lot of wives and partners out there just can't wait to slap on a duct tape over their partner's mouth before bedtime, you know, just to get some peace and quiet. Yeah. It's so funny, but yeah. Yeah. So it forces you to breathe through your nose and the, the dreams, the mental recall, the energy when you wake up and speaking of heart rate variability, that's improved blood sugar regulation, keto adaptation. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So I think, yeah, I mean, definitely get, make sleep a priority. Like it's your job. You show up at nine, you leave at five or whatever, but makes, make sure that you're getting to bed at the same time every night and then try to do that mouth taping things. You're breathing through your nose. And if you can't breathe through your nose, that is, that's really a symptom of sleep disordered breathing. So you need to figure out what that is. Is it food allergies? Is it alcohol? whole use? Is it uh, too much dairy and cheese consumption? Is it mold in your home? You need to figure that out because that's affecting your deep quality sleep and uh, which will in turn affect your metabolism, your risk of cancer, your microbiome and all that. So mouth taping is a huge tip. Yeah, it's amazing how it's all connected in terms of, you know, 